If you would have told us that this kid would be the only person that could physically harm Griffith after his ascendance 10 years ago, we'd have called you crazy. And yet that's exactly what he managed to do to the Falcon of Light, alongside instantly establishing himself as one of the most important characters in Berserk. Rickert made his debut fixing crossbows and admiring guts, but by the time we see him last in the story, he's firing crossbows much like guts. He's the only member of the Band of the Falcon to have survived the Eclipse unscathed, and while that might seem like a stroke of fortune to you, Berserk fans know that this is causality at work. Because as things stand currently, not even Guts can lay a finger on Griffith, which he became painfully aware of in Chapter 365. But exactly why does this former Falcon wield such importance in the story? What is his thematic role in Miura's creation? And what is his next move going to be, after flying off with some rather unlikely allies? We'll answer all that and more in this video. This is Rickert's Origins Explored. Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. He's a young kid with big dreams and two role models. Rickert's Introduction to Berserk If you were reading through the early pages of the Golden Age prequel arc and following Guts's journey into becoming a lone mercenary, then you too would have been shocked by the fact that his first major kill was probably about as young as him. Until that point in Berserk, mercenaries had always been portrayed as being gruff, old men, with a debased sense of morality and an unnecessary thirst for blood. That's what we thought of the Grey Knight Bazuso as well, when Guts stepped up to challenge him in a one-on-one -on -one fight in an unnamed Midland Castle. So imagine our surprise when we learned that it was quite possible that Bazuso could have been as young as Guts himself, because as it turns out, the entire band of the Falcon was comprised mainly of runaway youths, aspiring to make a name for themselves. They had a fierce reputation on the battlefield with a spotless win-loss record, but Guts hadn't thought they'd be just young men on the cusp of adulthood in many cases, given their success rate. And even amongst such a youthful force of mercenaries, young Rickert was undoubtedly the youngest and he was treated like it as well. He was introduced in Chapter 0M fixing a crossbow as Corcus whined about Griffith saving Guts in the first place. Despite the obvious age gap, it's Rickert who makes the more mature observation by saying that maybe Griffith was trying to gain an incredibly strong ally. Corcus kicks the crossbow Rickert was fixing out of his hands and states that he can't just forgive Guts for cutting down two of his men, but the young mercenary just thinks to himself that Corcus started that beef in the first place. After Guts is defeated by Griffith and added to the Band of the Falcon, Rickert witnesses his inhuman skill with a sword firsthand and starts borderline worshipping him. The Band of the Falcon was commissioned to carry out a night raid on the supply lines of their enemy forces, and because this was Guts's first mission as a Falcon, he was assigned the duty of being rear guard. It seemed like a thankless job, and a sure death sentence to everyone else in the band except Casca, who recognized that this was a sign of Griffith's trust in the swordsman. Rickert was one of the band's assaulting crossbowmen, and he accompanied them all the way through the raid, almost making it out safely. That's right, almost. Because during the retreat, Rickert ended up lagging behind the escaping file and had to fend off multiple pursuing cavalrymen. He was nearly overwhelmed by them when Guts popped up behind him and helped him escape. After returning to the rendezvous point, Rickert probably updated Griffith on Guts's location and trajectory, because the White Falcon then personally rescued his most valuable soldier. After running off their tail with multiple rounds of cannon fire, the Band of the Falcon celebrates their their victory in raucous fashion, and Rickard is the first one to approach Guts directly. Judo keeps his distance when trying to invite the brash fighter to his own welcome party, but Rickert went straight up to Sir Guts to express his gratitude and admiration. Gratitude for saving his life, and admiration for his fighting ability. Rickert tells Guts he has never seen anyone fight as well as him, except Griffith, of course, and he really respects him for it. The young kid has clearly found his two idols in life, and just wants an excuse to let loose with both of them, which tells us that at the very least, Rickert is of drinking age. He is also the person who informs Guts of his promotion to captain within the ranks of the Band of the Falcon, and celebrates with him alongside Pippin, who himself might as well be Rickert's big brother. This is where the Golden Age prequel arc ends, and though he only makes a handful of appearances, we can understand a lot about Rickert's personality. Number one, he is the band's resident weapon repairman and keeper, as he was seen fixing a crossbow in his very first appearance. Number two, he is wise beyond his years because he can see that Corcus's hatred of Guts is quite hypocritical, and number three, he has two role models in Griffith and Guts. The former is the very 
reason he joined the Band of the Falcon in the first place. As Judo explains to Guts the morning after their victory party, the reason why the band's members are so young is because, unlike regular mercs who do it for money or women, they do it for their dreams. Their own dream second, and Griffith's dream first. It is Griffith's natural charisma and inhuman military genius that has naturally drawn people of all ages to his mercenary band. It just so happens that most of them are young men who can still dream. Rickert was likely one of these young men, aspiring to knighthood, because he certainly possesses the disposition of one. But given his petite stature, he is more suited to ranged combat which is where his admiration for Guts comes in. The future black swordsman was still a lethal killer as a young'un, and the fact that he saved Rickert while doing what he does best instantly earned him relation points with the lad. For a time, Rickert idolized Guts and called him Sir, but as the years went by, their relationship settled into a strong friendship. Though Rickert was never the first person that Guts would go to talk to, he was always someone he could rely on as a friend. But as fate would have it, he was about to be forced to do that a whole heck of a lot more in the near future. An unlikely expert and a fortunate survivor. Rickert's role in the Golden Age arc. Berserk properly begins three years after Guts joins the Band of the Falcon. In those three years, Rickert's worship of him has mellowed down to a steadfast friendship. But what's more intriguing is the growth we see in him as an individual. Despite being the youngest Falcon by a long margin, Rickert might also be the smartest. He was already fixing complex weapons like crossbows since he was a teenager, and his passion for becoming a renowned mercenary meant that he was very well aware of legends on the battlefield. This included Nosferatu Zal whose background exposition was given to us by the young Falcon. He was a little surprised that Big Bro Pippin had never heard of this tale, despite having been an original Falcon, and so he explains that Zod was a legend of the battlefield, reputed to leave massacres as the only sure sign of his existence. Stories about him had been heard for well over a hundred years, and it was rumored that he was immortal. Rickert calls Zod a revered god of battle for mercenaries, and he isn't quite far off given the amount of feral fighters we'd already witnessed in the story by this point. Rickard is one of the few crossbowmen fortunate enough to survive Zod's onslaught and make it out of the Tudor fortress alive with both Guts and Griffith in tow, but that's mostly because the Immortal One was focused on killing those two in particular. Given his veteran status in the band, he was promoted to a unit commander himself, but what is interesting is that Rickard is the first person to voice out what everyone had started to think in the Band of the Falcon. Ever since becoming a Viscount, Griffith was drifting further and further away from them, so much so that they couldn't even go to visit him as he was recovering. And in hindsight, this should have probably been our first clue that things were never going to be the same for these mercenaries and their campfire of dreams. Rickard is next glimpsed in the fight against Adon Cobberwaltz's Blue Whale Knights, and then again during the battle for Doldry, where Corcus thinks he has lost his mind. This is because Tudor's highest military order, the Holy Purple Rhino Knights, were cutting through the band of the Falcon's lines. Rickard screamed out he'd rather drown than surrender fighting. This happened after Big Bro Pip and saved him from a rogue charge, so you can kind of see where Corcus was coming from. Like the rest of the soldiers on the battlefield, Rickert bore witness to Guts's vicious battle with the legendary Tudor General Boscon, and was one of the loudest to cheer him on after his victory. When the Band of the Falcon returned to Midland's capital city of Windham after their capture of Doldry, they were treated like heroes for finally ending the tedious Hundred Year War. If Rickert was overwhelmed by the reception they got in the streets, then he wasn't ready for the ball, because there, he was swarmed by countless noble ladies, who were instantly attracted to his cuteness. And what's more than that, he was granted peerage, as the Band of the Falcon was raised to the status of Midland's White Phoenix Knights, with Griffith being named White Phoenix General and all unit commanders being granted knighthood. All of this seemed like a wild dream to Rickert, and he acknowledges the fact that without Griffith, none of them would be standing where they were. The Band of the Falcon parties with nobility for what they believe to be the first of many times, but little do they know, this was the moment their lives would peak. It all began when Griffith died in front of their eyes at the victory ball. At the time, Rickert rushed to him and cried tears of despair, and then of joy when he realized that his leader was alive after all. But with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps even the ever-gentle Rickert would come to wish that the White Falcon had actually died that day. The next time he reunites with his two idols simultaneously is a little over a month after the victory ball, and the mysterious deaths of all of Griffith's political opponents, and he is unaware that this will be the last time he sees either of them. 
at least for a while. An emotional Rickert latches on to a departing Guts, asking him the reason for his departure, and whether he didn't love the Band of the Falcon after all. The much older Guts had already explained his reasons for leaving to Judo, so he didn't get into it with Rickert, whom he cared for just as much. But he did get into it with Griffith, who refused to let Guts leave his grasp unless he wrenched himself free. What followed was a short, yet decisive encounter, which was unexpectedly won by the future Black Swordsman. Rickert was heartbroken by the fact that Guts didn't even look back once before leaving them, but once again, he is also the first to notice that something was totally off about Griffith the next day. For starters, he didn't show up to the barracks after Guts' departure, and then he summoned the entire Band of the Falcon to one location, without any proper arms or armor, and threw a royal messenger at that. Rickert thought it was because Griffith had been impacted too hard by the loss of Guts as a comrade, but he was the first to realize that the people attacking the practically defenseless Band of the Falcon were actually from the Midland Army. Why would the Midland Army be attacking one of their highest ranking military units, you ask? Well, that's actually related to Griffith's absence, because the Mad Lad seduced the princess, got caught in the act, and basically signed his comrades' death warrants. None of them knew about this, of course, but the Band of the Falcon managed to survive nonetheless under the leadership of Casca. For an entire year, they roamed around Midland as outlaws, being constantly pursued by bounty hunters and royal inquisitors and none of the ones who survived would have if it weren't for Casca's leadership, a fact that Rickard openly acknowledges. In the absence of the only man who brought them all together, there was only one real option in the minds of the entire Band of the Falcon, freeing Griffith from imprisonment. And their year on the run hadn't been a total cat and mouse game either, as the band had managed to make contacts within Windham Castle itself and had formulated a plan to rescue Griffith to boot. But what they didn't realize is that they were effectively signing their own death sentences by doing so which is why Rickert was overjoyed to see Guts return. The peregrinating swordsman helps the band survive a night raid by some bounty hunters being led by Silet, and Rickert is overcome with emotion at his mere sight. After the battle is won, he tackles Guts with a run, because in his mind, this was it. Guts was the key to rescuing Griffith, and once he was out, they'd all go back to being the OG Band of the Falcon once again. They catch up like old times, and Rickert is thoroughly impressed by Guts' dedication to his swordsmanship. His eyes reflect optimism, because he thinks that once his leader is rescued, they'll just start over again, so he's a little disappointed that he is personally left out of the rescue team. Rickard had sustained an arm injury in their perilous travels, and it was now in a cast. He wanted to go with the Griffith rescue team, but he was assigned to their reserve squad instead, which was supposed to rendezvous with them after the mission was over. Rickard charges Guts with doing his part in the rescue as well, and Judo tells him not to worry, because when Griffith returns, they'll let Rickard hug him first. Ironically enough, Guts carries out Rickard's wish for him, because the first thing he does is hug Griffith upon seeing his broken and mangled body. This might as well be for the best, because we're not sure Rickert would want to hug Griffith after everything that happens from this point onward. As the reserve unit was resting on the banks of a river, Rickert did what he could for his comrades, and acted as a medical assistant and a page. One of his fellow falcons told him to fetch a pail of fresh water for the unit, and he left thinking that it was only natural everyone was excited for Griffith's return. Once their boss was back, it would be just like old times. But then Rickert saw an elf upon the river, and knew nothing would ever be the same again, though he didn't think it at first. After chasing the elf for a while, and realizing that he really did just see it, Rickert hears screams coming from their campsite, and rushes back desperately. He's terrified of losing it all to an enemy raid after having come so far, but what awaits him is a scene right out of a horror movie. Instead of Midland soldiers, he finds an army of apostles feasting on his comrades, dead or alive. Rickert is frozen with fear at this scene out of hell, and he can't even follow his dying comrade's advice and run away but turns out he doesn't need to. The Skull Knight appears just as the Apostles start closing in on him and scares them off, telling them they shouldn't amuse themselves here and to make haste for wherever it was they were supposed to go. Rickard is too shocked to thank the Skull Knight for saving his life, but not shocked enough to have an absolute emotional breakdown. He cries at the sight of his fallen comrade's corpses and despairs that they had been in good spirits just a few moments ago. His mind refuses to accept what has just unfolded in front of his very eyes, but he evidently accepts what's happening because Rickert finds his way out of the forest and into the carriage of a circus troupe. He doesn't realize how fortunate he was to survive what he did, because literally none of the rest of the band could manage to do it. I mean, it wasn't their fault, really. Griffith sacrificed them to demonkind to ascend and become Femto. But Rickert wasn't a part of this. In fact, he didn't even know about this until, like, a couple of years after it had happened. So to be completely honest with you guys, we feel for Rickert. But we're also filled with excitement because we know what is 
is about to come, and that's because this brave little kid might just secretly be the biggest pack god in all of Berserk. And yes, we're including Guts on that list. Morning, Training, and Revelation. What Rickert does after the Eclipse. Okay, so technically Rickert was a part of the Eclipse, in that he saw it happening from just outside the Interstice. After leaving the forest sick and delirious from his experience with the Apostles, Rickert meets a circus troupe, who graciously allow him to travel with them to his destination. They're heading for Midland's border, and we assume that Rickert wanted to go there because that was where Casca had told his unit to rendezvous with her after the mission was over. Along the journey, he meets a fortune teller, the same fortune teller who gave Griffith his Behelet, and an elf who would turn out to be Puck, Guts' closest ally during his Black Swordsman days. Rickert was dropped off at the border by the troop and given a bit of elf dust for his pale and sickly face when the eclipse happened. The fortune teller inside the wagon was concerned about his health, and so she looked into his future to see what was about to happen to him, and what she saw was the advent of the Age of Darkness itself. When Puck asked her why she didn't simply recall Rickert if him leaving was such a bad idea, she simply replies by telling him Rickert has a huge part to play in what's to come, and that it was not her business to mess with another person's fate. Keep this detail in mind because it's going to be important later. The fortune teller decides to simply bear witness to what's about to happen, and inadvertently, so does Rickert, because he arrives at the border of the Interstice and finds the Skull Knight and Nosferatu Zod there. Rickert immediately recognizes Skull Knight as his savior, but is extremely confused by the magical whirlwind in front of his mortal eyes. He wonders what happened to his comrades whom he was supposed to meet here, as the two eternal enemies face off in front of his eyes. Rickard is amazed by the fact that Skull Knight was able to match, nay, defeat the legendary Nosferatu Zod and force his way past him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. But before he could recover from his shock, he was met by familiar faces once again. The skeletal warrior had gone inside the interstice alone, but emerged from within it with a heavily injured guts in Casca in tow, for which Rickard was instantly grateful. He then ran the emotional gauntlet as Zod advanced on him and Skull Knight, and Skull Knight yelled at him to hurry up healing the branded pair as they were not destined to die just yet. Rickard is equally amazed with the efficiency of elf dust at healing wounds, but he's also confused. The immortal and the Skull Knight were having a conversation about guts, but all he could think about was the rest of his comrades. Rickard asked the Skull Knight what happened to the Band of the Falcon, and the enigmatic warrior simply replied that no one was left. Before he even had the time to grieve, Rickard was whisked away by the Skull Knight on his majestic horse and brought to Godot's home, the same place where Guts had been training in his year away from the Falcons. Skull Knight didn't do this because he knew about Guts' relationship with Godot and Erika. He can't perceive the flow of causality like Void, after all. No, he did it because Godot's ore mine used to be an elfin habitat, and thus was the only place safe for the branded pair. The Skull Knight gave Rickert one job, to make sure that Guts and Casca didn't leave the cave, because otherwise they'd be in danger. He didn't specify why exactly, but that isn't what's important here. What is important is that Rickert failed at doing even that much. Though he had tended to both Guts and Casca for four days, and did his best not to lose his desire to live, he had no idea what those two had been through, and neither would he. And after Casca escaped her cave, he knew better than to push the topic. Rickert reluctantly accepted the fact that the Band of the Falcon was truly dead, and understood why Guts didn't want to talk about it. But, like the Black Swordsman, he wasn't about to just sit around idly. One day, Rickert accompanied Godot's adopted daughter Erika to a storehouse filled with ingenious weapons and armor all of Godot's creation. He learned from Erika that her father was a master blacksmith who could make anything his customers asked for, and that's when he saw the Dragon Slayer. We just want to point out that Rickert was the first person to canonically see that massive sword in Berserk, and our next section will explain why we think that's relevant. Godot comes in and explains to the young Merc that he used to be great at his craft, but age had taken its toll on him. He also tells him the tale of the Dragon Slayer, which, coupled with his creations, open up a new path for Rickert. He starts tinkering with every everything he finds in Godot's storehouses, and mines and creates the cannon arm that has become an iconic part of Guts' design. He also modifies the mounted crossbow he saw so it can fit in Guts' new arm, which was also magnetized to help him wield a sword better. Rickert witnesses his creations being used firsthand as Guts fires off the cannon at an apostle who has tracked him down and so his fate is sealed for the foreseeable future. Well, Godot had already decided that he was going to make Rickert work off Guts' debts, but that also means our boy was now officially a blacksmith's apprentice. Over the next two years, Years, Rickert learns every trick in the trade that Godot can still teach him and creates numerous swords that he uses as grave markers for his fallen comrades. He comes to view Godot as his master and Erika as a little sister 
but it wasn't as if he didn't try to make Guts a part of this team. Before the Black Swordsman departed, Rickert tried convincing him to stay with Casca, because for him, the Band of the Falcon was over, and Casca was where Guts should be focusing his energy. But the Raider Captain declares that the Band isn't over yet, and charges him with protecting their leader while he went and raided the enemy camp. And so he did, for two years, to the best of his abilities while mourning his comrades as well. Something Guts never really got around to doing. Rickert found new, important things to cherish, but he never forgot the old, because when Guts came calling two years later, he immediately came clean about his mistakes. He'd allowed Casca to escape. Well, it was Erica, but Rickard felt responsible anyway. He went looking for her every day since it happened, but so far he'd been unsuccessful. And what's worse, Master Godot was dying. Erica would soon be fatherless, and Rickard without direction. Yet Guts nearly throttled him for letting Casca go. It took a serious philosophical lecture from Godot to get him to realize his mistake, but Rickard didn't mind. If anything, he was thankful that Guts was still the same, and Erica was about to smile again because of Puck, someone he met on a chance encounter before the eclipse. He gives Guts new explosives and a better crossbow before he departs next, and tells him to come back with Casca. But no one could have expected that Griffith would come as an added bonus. Following the incarnation ceremony, Griffith visited the Hill of Swords Rickert had erected in honor of his fallen comrades, and finally came face to face with his former comrade. Rickert, of course, was delighted to see his leader, because he didn't know what had happened in that day two years ago, and Guts refused to talk about it. He was crying tears of joy, because to him, this was his idol returning back from the grave, allegedly, which is why he was confused as to why Guts was attacking him. And he became even more confused when he saw Nosferatu Zod protecting Griffith. Rickert then bore witness to Guts' inhuman development as a fighter as the Black Swordsman engaged in a fierce battle with the Beast Swordsman. But he was also conflicted. He just wanted the fight to end so someone could explain everything to him. But Griffith just left his questions with more questions. He told Rickert that he could still join him even after he learned the truth if he still shared his dream, and flew off with Zod, telling Guts not nothing had changed. When Rickert finally demanded the truth from Guts, it came to him as a shock. He broke down immediately because he was sad, not just at finding out the truth, but realizing that Guts had been carrying its burden with him for so long all by himself. He immediately volunteered to join the Black Swordsman on his quest, but was rejected by Guts for two reasons. Number one, Erica, who was running off because everyone was talking about leaving again, and number two, because he could never really bring himself to hate Griffith. Rickert knew Guts had struck at a home truth there, because he was, by nature, a gentle person. Sure, Rickert was a mercenary who fought for a living at one point, and he could make weapons that have taken countless apostles' lives, but he wasn't malicious by nature. He was, at his core, a good person. And this is where Rickert becomes so important to the story, because this little kid is about to go from baby Rickert to Berserk's most celebrated character. He managed to do what Guts couldn't with his Dragon Slayer and that's why we will see him again, how Rickard's story affects the overall story of Berserk. After the great roar of the astral world causes the advent of Fantasia, Rickert realizes that if he wants to survive with Erica, he needs to get to the only remaining safe haven for humanity, Griffith's utopian capital city of Falconia. Rickert helps a caravan trying to get there safely by using a mounted crossbow of his own design to hold off trolls, but it wasn't good enough. Just as he and Erica began running out of ammunition, arrows rained down from the trees and stopped the trolls' assault. Rickert felt a familiar sensation as Irvine the Apostle stepped through the trees and helped his party reach Falconia safely by defeating an actual cockatrice and several trolls. Knowing apostles, Rickert questioned why they were working alongside humans now, and worse, why they were flying the banner of the Band of the Falcon. When he arrives in Falconia, Rickert meets Sir Laban, who recognized him earlier from the Hundred Year War days, and receives a special permit to meet Griffith in person, and at first he's conflicted about it. Rickert obviously wanted to meet him, and hear what he had to say for himself in defense of his actions, because, as we all know, Rickert is a good guy. But he was also responsible for Erica now, and didn't trust Griffith as much as he used to for obvious reasons. So he decides to chill around in Falconia for a bit and dazzle his apartment manager Luca with his engineering skills. And we say engineering because this boy literally improvises a flamethrower on the fly. But we'll get there in just a second. Rickard also meets the sorcerer Daiba, who used to be the right-hand man of Emperor Ganishka, but he doesn't know this because he's never met the man before. After stewing on his decision and witnessing the manifestation of Griffith's dream in Falconia, he decides he'll go see him anyway, and so Rickard walks all the 
way to the Falcon's castle, which he admits was a dumb idea because of its sheer size. When he gets there, he's greeted by another familiar face, Sir Owen, who leads him to witness a miracle in real life. Rickert sees Griffith as the Falcon of Light, use his divine powers to allow Falconians to commune with their deceased loved ones before they passed into the afterlife. Rickert's mind is boggled by what he's seeing, but the surprises don't stop coming because he is then approached by Griffith's spokesperson, Locus. The Moonlight Knight borrows Rickert from Sir Owen and decides, on a whim, to show him the truth about the man his leader has become. Locus discusses the divine right of kings with Rickert and claims that as the incarnation of Femto in the physical world, Griffith embodied that very concept, though not as explicitly as we're saying it here, of course, and then proceeds to show him his new beacon talons as the pair enter Pandemonium. And yes, we do mean that literally. Locus shows Rickert the war demons who reside in the Dome of Pandemonium Pandemonium, where they perpetually fight in savage gladiator fights to keep their bloodlust at bay. To Locus, the fact that the war demons are doing even this much to protect the humans is a sign that Griffith is the one true divine king. He wanted Rickert to know this before he met him, so he could understand just what a transcendental figure Griffith had become. So naturally, when Rickert saw the Falcon of Light, he proceeded to slap him so hard that the Berserk fandom still hasn't recovered from it. After doing everything he did to their comrades, Griffith had the audacity to ask Rickert if he still wished to join him in fulfilling his dream. Of course, the young man rejected his offer. Locus was beyond furious at the sight of his god being punked by a literal child as well, but he couldn't make a move because Griffith forbade it. That didn't stop Silat or Rakshas from doing so, though they did it for reasons independent of one another. Silat saw Rickert slap Griffith and instinctively knew he was somehow the key to defeating him, so he wanted to know what Rickert knew, and for that he was willing to kidnap him. Rakshas, on the other hand, was just a homicidal maniac who wanted to pack Rickert for disrespect his master like that. Rickert, Silet, and his Tapasa managed to defeat Rakshas using that flamethrower we talked about earlier. But then the Apostle entered his released form and things got real. If it hadn't been for Daiba, who had taken a liking to Rickert and Erica thanks to the latter's kindness, they'd have all died in Falconia, but they all managed to escape. As of now, Rickert is heading for the secret mountain hideout of the Bakiraka clan, with unlikely company in Erica, Silat, Daiba, the Tapasa duo, and several Garudas. But despite Berserk being on a hiatus, we can assure you that he will show up again. And the reason for that is simple. He's the only person who managed to physically harm Griffith. Although we know next to nothing about Rickert's origins, we can assume that he was somewhat like that ten-year-old boy who died so Griffith's dream could live. Perhaps he had always aspired to be a knight in a mercenary band, serving the cause of a leader so charismatic his success was a literal bane for others. But it seems like the one thing that is clear is that while he admired Griffith as a leader, his story ended when Griffith ended himself as a proper flesh and blood human. Make no mistake, Femto, or the incarnated Griffith, is not the same person that Rickert used to know, and he mourned that person for two years thinking he was dead. But when he realized Griffith was alive, Rickert's initial joy was turned into a form of hatred, because he slapped Griffith across his face for showing no remorse for what he did during the eclipse. He also noted that the reborn Band of the Falcon's banner design was different from the old one, with its wings spread farther out before rejecting the Falcon of Light as his leader. Rickert confidently proclaimed that his leader was the White Falcon Griffith, and this is why he is the pack god of Berserk. See, in Chapter 237, Skull Knight mentioned that after Griffith's incarnation in the physical world, it was as if he was the author of his own story. That's the kind of power he wielded. He said that only those outside of Griffith's story could now influence his fate, and this is where little Ricky comes in. We think it's extremely important to note that Rickert properly mourned Griffith and moved on from him before being reintroduced to him as the Falcon of Light. He has found a new path in Erica and his blacksmith, Thing, and he intends to keep at it while helping out his friends. But Guts has not yet moved on from Griffith. In fact, it is made clear multiple times in the manga that his real reason for living at the moment is Griffith himself. Guts doesn't care about Casca as much as he cares about killing Griffith, and even his inner beast of darkness urges him to become like the fallen Falcon. But Rickert, having moved on, is now perhaps outside of Griffith's story, and that could be why he was able to slap him the way he did. Rickert most likely didn't have the dream of the Falcon of Light either, and he could also know something else about Griffith besides his true nature that can be weaponized by Silat and Daiba in the mountains. But the main thing we want to point out before we end this video is that Rickert might just be Exhibit A of the idea of good in the world of Berserk. So far, he's the only character who has actively fought on the right side at the right times. He has a keen sense of perception of the truth of things which was evident from his observations about Griffith after he was ennobled, and he is wise beyond his years. But despite being a mercenary, Rickert has always been in believed in the idea of good, and if there were some such metaphysical entity that governed something like fate or causality in Berserk, 
we'd wager that this is what is on his side. That fortune teller we spoke of earlier foretold that Rickert would have a huge part to play in what was about to come. And in our opinion, a single slap is not it. It will be interesting to see how Kuji Mori's team handles this storyline going forward but it is clear that Rickert is a key player in the overall story of Berserk, and you can bet good money on the fact that when he shows up next, some major revelations are going to be made. Marvelous Verdict! And that's it for this video. Now you know why an entire fandom is gaga over a guy who is barely legal by most modern standards. Rickard is like an innocent medieval Tony Stark who can make pretty much anything he puts his mind to, but at the same time, he is also the only one to have proven that Griffith is not absolute as everyone else believes, because to him, Griffith is already dead. The Falcon of Light is not the White Falcon he knew as a member of the Band of the Falcon, and that is why we respect this absolute gigachad. Intention and emotions have a lot of magical significance in Berserk, and we aren't calling Rickard a wizard, but we are saying that the fact that he moved on was the magic that allowed him to backhand Femto Physical. We don't know what the plan is yet going forward as Studio Gaga is yet to make a statement about Berserk's resumption, but with Casca being brought to Falconia and Guts in the depths of despair, we think it's only a matter of time until we see Rickard again, and best believe that when we do, it's going to be earth shattering. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.